We are very happy to have uh, Professor Devaruti Chatterjee from Ayuka, and she will talk about some uh, neutron star astronomy. So I will hand it over to her to start. Thank you very much, Arpan, and thanks to all those who are present, even though it's a Sunday afternoon. Um, I will try to keep this talk as entertaining as possible so that, uh, I mean, your Sunday is not ruined. So let me share my screen. All right. Just a second. Okay, so you can see the screen, right? Yeah. Okay. So um, uh, thanks to IIT Gandhinagar for inviting me to give this talk. It's my uh, pleasure to be here today. Um, so I'm Debharati Chatterjee. I am an associate professor at uh, Ayuka Inter-University Center for Astronomy and Astrophysics. I'm also a key member of the LIGO India project and also member of LIGO Scientific Collaboration and LIGO India Scientific Collaboration. So today I'm going to talk about how um, gravitational waves can act as a tool for probing extreme physics. So um, I will first outline what I mean by extreme physics. So as, um, just a second. Okay. I think I'm still on. Yeah, all right. So um, what I meant by uh, extreme physics is that we are looking into the building blocks of matter. We are looking, in, we are trying to look into the densest forms of matter in the universe. So as uh, some of you might already know, so this is the state of the art knowledge that we have. Uh, from nuclear physics and particle physics. Uh, so we have a standard model, right? So what does this model tell us? It's that matter is made up of atoms. Again, this, is, uh, this can be broken down into nuclei and electrons and protons. So the nuclei consists of neutrons and protons. And uh, again, imagine looking into matter with an extremely powerful telescope. So what do you see? When you go um, further and further into the building blocks of matter, ultimately you see that even these neutrons and protons are built up of constituent quarks. So uh, we can say that the ultimate building blocks of matter are leptons on one hand. So you can see these figures at the bottom. Leptons means electrons, muons, uh, tau, particles, etc. And on the right hand side, you can see quarks. So there are six flavors of quarks. And these compose all the matter that we see around us. Okay, so how, how can we prove this? Um, as you can see that you need more and more powerful, more and more energetic tools to look into uh, matter to see what are the fundamental building blocks, right? So um, first of all, we can imagine nuclear experiments. So nuclear experiments, with nuclear experiments, we can look into nuclei, right? Um, just a second, can you mute yourself? Um, Arpan, can you uh -huh. mute? Yeah. Can you mute the participants? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so um, like I said, so uh, nuclear experiments give us a fairly good idea about um, how uh, what nuclei are composed of. Okay, so you can see this figure um, again. There is. Okay, so let me try again. So uh, if you can see this figure on the left-hand side, you see that this is the idea we have of the nuclear potential. So what does it tell us? It tells us that there is a short range repulsive core, which means when you go very close, at very close range, then the uh, nuclear force has a repulsive nature. And at longer distances, it has an attractive nature. 
So this behavior tells us that there is a certain saturation behavior of nuclei. And also we can determine binding energies of nuclei from nuclear experiments. So nuclear experiments give us, um, so what is the saturation energy per particle? What is the density and uh, also the binding energies and so on. There are also certain experiments which uh, help us to probe matter, which is not only, uh, so which is not at uh, um, neutron proton symmetric nature, which means that most of the nuclear experiments we have in the, in the laboratories, they have almost the same number of neutrons and protons. Whereas uh, there are, are some experiments which help us to probe what happens when you go to a very den very neutron rich matter okay so you can see that there is an experiment uh, called isol trap experiment you see this figure on the right hand side you see that uh, these experiments actually probe uh, very so this region which is very far away from this beta stability line which is the line where you have experiments at almost the same number of neutrons and protons okay and there are also these experiments like uh, which are called uh, giant resonances or pygmy resonances. So what these do is they uh, probe into nuclear vibrations. So different kind of nuclear vibrations, which also tell us about um, so something called neutron skin thickness, which means uh, you look at the figure at the bottom, you see that uh, there are there is a difference between the say the RMS neutron radius and the proton radius, and therefore this, this difference is called the neutron neutron skin. So it's like a neutron skin surrounding the nucleus. So this can also be probed with some experiments. So all these tell us about the behavior of matter, which is not only at the same number of neutrons and protons, but also far away from it. So very neutron rich matter. What else, inf what other information can we have from terrestrial experiments? There are now these heavy ion collision experiments. You must have heard about CERN, uh, which is uh, the nuclear facility, the European nuclear facility at uh, the French uh, border, French Swiss border. You might also have learned about some other experiments like Ganil facility, uh, which is in France and GSI in Darmstadt. Uh, so what happens in these experiments is that uh, beams of uh, heavy particles are made to collide and then these stream out particles and forming a core gluon plasma and this is hot and dense matter so this is also some experiment which helps us to probe the nature of dense matter okay so these are all the different um, experiments that we can conduct on earth to find out about the nature of the extreme nature of dense matter but what if i told you that there are also certain astrophysical um, sites, astrophysical objects, which can give us much more information about dense matter. So exactly one of this kind of uh, object is called a neutron star or a pulsar. And this was um, uh, serendipitously discovered by Jocelyn Bell, who was a PhD student at Cambridge University. So in 1967, she had, uh, she noticed some scribbles, uh, strange scribbles in her, in the radio frequencies that she was studying with her radio telescope while, while trying to observe quasars. So from this, uh, she noted that these were extremely periodic pulses that were arriving from outer space towards the earth. So initially, people even thought that they, these might be uh, alien signals, but it was quickly understood that this is nothing but a pulsar, which means it's like a pulsating, it's a rotating compact star and giving out a strong electromagnetic beam along its axis. And every time this beam sweeps the Earth, it gives out a pulse. Okay, So these pulsars or compact stars are also uh, one of uh, like an astrophysical laboratory in space that can give us a lot of information about dense matter. How is that? So to understand this, we'll have to look at the origin of pulsars. So normal neutrons, normal stars, like say that of the sun, or it can also be say up to eight to 10 times that of the sun. So what happens there is that these, so 
light starts like the sun so the sun keeps burning because it burns hydrogen fuel in its interior producing helium and this balances the this thermal pressure balances the gravity and therefore this is a stable um, stable object right so what happens in more massive stars say like 8 to 10 times as massive as the sun this kind of fusion continues to produce heavier and heavier elements so like hydrogen is burnt to produce helium and then consequently carbon oxygen silicon and iron that you can see in the inset but what happens is that now when okay i will play this uh, once again so you see that this uh, is the cycle of such um, a star and uh, so when these when this fusion proceeds it gives off energy right it gives off energy thermal energy which supports the star against gravitational collapse but once these outer um once um okay so once uh, iron is formed in the core what happens is that you can see here in the inset so iron has the um, the highest binding energy possible and uh, therefore what happens is burning iron cannot produce any more energy so here fusion stops and therefore what happens is the there is a collapse of the outer layers forming um, then ultimately nuclear energies are reached at the core and there is a bounce and throwing out these outer layers into space this is something which is called a core collapse supernova explosion you can see these beautiful pictures if you go to the nasa web pages you can see beautiful pictures of uh, supernova explosions like this so this is the crab nebula and uh, the crab um, uh, so uh, which is left behind after such an explosion and so you can see here in this schematic figure so this is this bounce and the outer layers being thrown out into outer space and uh, what ultimately is left behind is the core and this core is what forms a compact star or a neutron star so um, if we look at the life cycle of a star so this is exactly what i mentioned now so a massive star uh, goes through these cycles where ultimately there is the supernova explosion and the core forms the neutron star but like i said so why are we studying neutron stars because neutron stars are actually the densest form of matter in the universe so these are like astrophysical laboratories in space that uh, can help us to probe the densest form of matter in the universe so this little fact sheet at the bottom can give you an idea about this so in in norm so normally neutron stars have masses around uh, one to two times that of the sun but within a very small radius of only 10 kilometers so imagine crushing the sun or like twice the mass of the sun into a radius of 10 kilometers so you can imagine how high the density inside this object can be so the densities can go up to 2 to 10 times that of nuclear densities the temperature however is quite low so initially when the neutron star is formed it's called a proton neutron star it is quite hot but then energies are taken away by particles called neutrinos and then it is left with a very cold um, neutron star okay and um, so these temperatures are so low in comparison with the uh, the particles that form the neutron star it is essentially um, assumed to be at zero temperature so it's a cold system also the magnetic fields in general are quite high because uh, this progenitor star when it collapses because of conservation of flux it um, the magnetic field blows up and uh, so normally neutron stars can be can have magnetic fields around 10 to the 10 to 10 to the 12 gauss but there are also objects called magnetars which have fields as high as 10 to the 15 gauss so these are Uh, magnetars are nothing but ultra magnetized neutron stars so you can see that from this fact sheet that neutron stars are have a extreme kind of physics so if you want to probe extreme physics this is the only accessible uh, astrophysical laboratory because these conditions cannot be uh, reproduced here on earth we don't yet have such machines which can produce such extreme physics so um 
Another important point is that all these terrestrial experiments that I mentioned to you earlier, so these nuclear experiments and heavy ion collision experiments, they also probe dense matter, right? So you will ask then why neutrons does. So the point is that if you look at the phase diagram of dense matter, you will realize that these are actually probing complementary regions. So this phase diagram is nothing but the density in the x-axis the temperature on the y-axis. And you can also consider uh, another axis, which is the difference between neutron and proton, neutron number and proton number. So normal nuclear experiments that I talked about in the beginning, these probe uh, densities around, so this x-axis, this baryon density is normalized to saturation nuclear density. So one means that nuclei or nuclear experiments, these probe around saturation density of nuclear matter. On the other hand, the heavy ion collision experiments that I mentioned, so LHC is the Large Hadron Collider, you have the FAIR facility, which is GSI that I mentioned, there is another upcoming facility called NICA, and so on. So these are these heavy ion collision experiments, which probe uh, hot, dense matter. So uh, these are at finite temperatures, and also they have the same number of protons and neutrons. Whereas neutron stars, if you look at these compact stars at the bottom of the figure, they probe zero temperature. Like I mentioned, they are cold systems. They probe between two to 10 times that of saturation density. So this is this region. And also it lies on the other axis because it has large number of neutrons as compared to protons. It's full of neutrons. That's why it's called a neutron star. So you see that um, although nuclear experiments and heavy ion experiments give us some information about the behavior of dense matter, these are slightly different conditions than those of compact stars. And therefore, all the different models of that you can think of to construct neutron stars, they do not exactly have the same conditions. So there are some uncertainties in these models involved. So now that we have this information from nuclear experiments and heavy ion collision experiments, let us try to construct what can be there inside the neutron star interior. So um, nuclear experiments tell us that, uh, okay, neutron star um, in the, at least in the external uh, core, external crust, there should be nuclei and iron nuclei, right? But the density of a neutron star varies hugely, right? So it's uh, between two to 10 times that of saturation density and it grows towards the interior. So what kind of matter can we expect? So from outside going inwards, we can expect these nuclei to become more and more neutron rich as we go inwards. So um, further, you can see in this inset that there are these nuclei and uh, in the outer crust, you have a nuclei rich in neutrons, but these nuclei become so rich in neutrons that they start to drip out of the nuclei. So this is a region which is called the inner crust. And finally, these nuclei start to become deformed because of the very high pressure that you have these, at these very high densities. And they form very strange structures which almost, almost look like pasta. So they are also called pasta phases. So these strangely deformed nuclei finally melt into a homogeneous liquid. And this region is called the outer core. And this, of course, con contains primarily neutrons, but um, also this entire neutron star has to also be uh, charge neutral, because if there is uh, any astrophysical system which is not charge neutral, then it will not be stable. Coulomb forces are very uh, much more powerful than gravitational forces. So um, you have free neutrons and also a small fraction of protons and electrons to ensure um, chemical equilibrium and charge neutrality. But this is not the whole picture. So this is what, this is the information that uh, nuclear experiments and heavy ion collection experiments tell us. So we have like a jigsaw puzzle, we have put together this information. But now that you go closer and closer to like say eight to 10 times saturation density, we really don't have any idea what can happen at those densities. 
So we have a little bit of an idea from heavy ion collision experiments because what happens in those accelerators is that while this coagulon plasma is produced, before that you, you see for fractions of a second, strangeness containing particles appearing and disappearing. So these particles in the collision experiments appear in pairs and they are called hyperons and kaons. And there could even be deconfined quark matter. So quark is the ultimate building block of matter. And these are seen momentarily, so not quarks, but uh, because uh, quarks are not, uh, I mean, because of a certain property of, um, of it's called asymptotic freedom. So there is a property um, in the, of quarks which do not allow them to be, um, uh, to exist freely in nature. But uh, at least hyperons and kaons have been seen in heavy ion collision experiments. And it is thought that they should also be stable components of neutron star interiors. So now, um, if so there are many theoretical models. So these theoretical models, um, just a second. So these theoretical models, um, try to put together this information from these uh, state-of-the-art experiments and also there are many theoretical nuclear um, nuclear model theoretical models okay which try to reproduce nuclear forces and when you put these together you have different theoretical models but um, these theoretical models like i said they can give uh, they can reproduce very well all these observables that are seen in these uh, terrestrial experiments, but they cannot tell you what is there beyond because the problem is that these models have different kinds of parameters and these parameters are fitted around saturation density. So as you go away from saturation density, there is a large uncertainty and these models actually diverge. So we are still not able to understand what is going on in the interior of neutron stars, which is the extreme kind of dense matter physics that we are trying to probe. So what can we do? We now look at observations. So um, here in this schematic figure, you can see that um, models, theoretical models of equation, uh, theoretical models of neutron stars, which are also called equations of state. So equation of state is nothing but a relation between pressure, temperature, and uh, density. So since neutron stars are cold, so uh, it is basically for neutron stars, equation of state is a relationship between pressure and density. So this pressure and density uh, is the relation which um, helps to distinguish between these different theoretical models because they show up as different lines on this figure. So now that you have these different equations of state depending on the different core compositions and different theoretical models, uh, different kind of interactions between nuclei that uh, theoretical uh, nuclear physicists try to um, calculate. So from this one, one can construct equations of state. And then once you have the equation of state, why do we want an equation of state? Because this is nothing but a very useful parameter that can relate the interior composition with the exterior structure or exterior properties, global observables of neutron stars that can be actually observed by astronomers. So um, just to give you an example, this equation of state is, um, an input that goes into hydrostatic equilibrium equations. They are also called uh, TOV equations. So what happens in those hydrostatic equi equilibrium equations is that you um, basically balance the pressure and the gravity. So uh, the equation of state determines the pressure, okay? And therefore you understand what is this, the balance between gravity and pressure ultimately, um, determines what is the structure of the neutron star, which means the mass and its radius. So if you plot the mass and radius of the neutron star, you can see that there is a kind of a mapping. So on the left-hand side, you see these equations of state, these different lines. And on the right-hand side, you see this, uh, the mass radius plots. Again, at the bottom, there is a cartoon. It can tell you what I'm trying to say. So when you have just nucleons in a neutron star, so you have a very stiff equation of state, which means that you have a steep pressure versus density curve. While um, 
if you have uh, these hyperons, kaons, these kind of exotic particles inside the interior, you will have a softer equation of state. Now, again, if you translate, you map this from equation of state to the mass radius plot, you have these corresponding mass radius plots. And what is now known is that if you have a stiff equation of state, it will correspond to a larger maximum mass and the softer equation of state corresponds to a lower maximum mass. So now we want to look uh, using telescopes, astronomers try to look at observables. So we have at our disposal today, a large number of astronomical facilities, okay? So these uh, scan the sky uh, throughout the electromagnetic spectrum. So starting from gamma rays, uh, to X-rays, ultraviolet, visible, infrared, microwave, up to radio. So visible is where we usually point our telescopes, binoculars, and so on, uh, to see observable um, objects, right? So um, uh, most of the high uh, uh, frequency uh, astronomical facilities are space-based, whereas the radio telescopes, these are huge dish antennas, so these are ground-based, okay? So what these do is uh, they scan the entire sky at different frequencies. This is almost like, uh, you can imagine, it's almost like medical imaging. So in medical imaging, what is done is that you also look at, say, the human body with different frequencies, right? So you can, uh, we use x-rays to look into the bones. We also use um, infrared images. We use gamma rays and so on. So what these tell us is about the different fluids and uh, bones and different structures inside the body. In almost the same way now, if you see this um, a neutron star at different frequencies, it will give you complementary information about the structure. So for example, here, this is the crab nebula that I told you about earlier. So this crab nebula, you see this um, uh, image at the top, you see that it's the same crab nebula seen at different frequencies. So at infrared and at other frequencies, radio, you see the interstellar dust. Whereas at X-rays, you see this internal compact star, which is the neutron star. And you can also see this electromagnetic radiation coming out from its axis. So- there is a yes. question in the chat, actually. I just noticed. noticed. Yes. Okay. Let me try and have a look. Equation of state models assume the matter to be in a gaseous state. Uh, this is not actually true. So you are talking about the ideal gas equation of state. So the ideal gas equation of state is one example of equations of state. So um, let me go back. Sorry. Sorry, I have to stop share and share again. So uh, you were talking mostly about the, uh, so equation of state, of course, is a general term. So equation of state, you must have already encountered equation of state in the context of ideal gas. That is what you're talking about. So of course, ideal in ideal gases, like uh, it's the relation between E, V, and T, right? Pressure, volume, and temperature. Or you can also write it as pressure, density, and temperature. So like I said, equation of state is nothing but a relation between pressure, density, temperature in general for any system. But um, in the context of neutron stars, because these are zero temperature systems, this is the uh, density, temp density pressure relationship. But um, it's not necessarily that this has to be a gas. It's, I mean, you can, so, um, I mean, of course you can also, uh, so neutron stars can, not neutron stars, say, um, I mean, the problem is, I'll tell you what, so neutron stars, if you try to imagine neutrons as a fluid, uh, a ball of fluid, okay, say neutrons only. So neutrons are also fermions. So you can imagine it as a Fermi gas. The problem is that in that case, uh, this has already been done. So in the beginning, when people were trying to understand uh, neutron stars, what they did is they modeled it as a gas of fermions. If you have already encountered fermi fermions in your 
studies. So um, if, if you imagine it to be a gas of free fermions, what happens is that um, in that case, you cannot explain the masses of neutron stars around um, one to two solar mass. So in that case, you see that the major contribution comes from nuclear interactions. So you can also imagine here um, neutron, I mean, in the simplest case, it, uh, the neutron star to be composed of a gas of neutrons, okay? But uh, like I said, this is not the whole picture. You need to take into account the nuclear interactions also. Sorry. So my question was that, yeah, gas dynamics models are there. But I was curious if, if let's say, matter is in a in a crystalline state, let's say, mm -hmm. and then using because we are dis distinguishing between soft matter or stiff matter, etc. Mm -hmm. so those are the property of a solid. I mean, which is a lattice kind of a structure, and then electrons are basically forming a gas. So, what could be the role of the structured lattice, if at all, is there? So. Because gas dynamics fine if if it is in gaseous state or liquid state or fluid state it is fine, but if we talk about solid like model, then how the equation of state will be defined? So, what are the yeah. experimental evidences to use to not assume that there could be a solid like structure? So, like I said, I mean this is a colloquium, so I'm not going into much of the details. But as I showed this picture, um, so this is a much more complicated problem. So uh, like I mentioned, so this neutron star in going from the surface to the interior, it has almost all kinds of matter you can think of. It's an extremely complicated problem. So um, I mean, like I said, so in general, you can you can imagine it to be a, a ball of neutrons. Okay, so this is the simplest picture if you want to imagine it as an ideal gas. But uh, of course, it's a much more complicated picture because there are uh, lattice of nuclei on the outer in the outer crust, and then there are um, these deformed lattice structures. Uh, so these are actually modeled using molecular dynamic simulations. Finally, you have this homogeneous uh, fluid inside, and again in, within the inner core, you can have crystalline phases as well. So it's an extremely complicated picture, and th this is why it is not possible to have a simple equation of state. And this is why you have uh, so many different kinds of. I mean, I'm just showing here a schematic figure, but um, I mean there are. Uh, this is an interdisciplinary field because you have to take into account condensed matter physics, you have um, nuclear physics, you have particle physics, there are uh, superfluids inside. So it's a much more complicated picture than that. And of course, this is even more complicated because there are phase transitions in going like there is liquid gas, um, liquid solid. So there are different phase transitions happening throughout these different densities. And it is not known exactly which kind of uh, phase transition there is, whether it's first order, whether it's second order. So it's a very complicated problem, but I'm just giving you a very simple picture to say that, I mean, all this complexity is um, inside this modeling of the equation of state. So I'm just giving you a very uh, naive picture of the whole thing. Yeah, thank you. That is helpful. Yeah, sure. Is there another question, probably? Let me have a look. Oh. I'm not able to. Okay. Okay. No, I think you can continue. Uh -huh. All right. All right. So, um, right. So, I was telling you about these uh, different. Uh, so when pulsars are looked at at different frequencies, like I told you, like medical imaging, you can uh, have much more information about the neutron star and its surroundings. Okay, And what it also tells you is that there are all these different observables that I was talking about. So there are these different structure properties that you can derive from all these multi-wavelength observations. So for example, uh, you, I already told you that uh, Jocelyn Bell, when she discovered pulsars, they 
she found these very periodic radio pulses. So these give, give us information about its spin period. So spin period of pulsars is one of the most accurately determined uh, quantities. Then you can also um, derive the masses of neutron stars, particularly if they are in binaries, because not only Keplerian, so what Kepler had uh, predicted were some features of uh, like, um, what can I say? So uh, there are some, some properties called Keplerian, Keplerian properties, but because neutron stars are extremely uh, relativistic, they also show post Keplerian parameters. And from this, we can determine masses of neutron stars in binaries very accurately. And not only that, you can also determine moment of inertia, um, temperature, it's uh, radius. Radius is not very accurate, you know, but uh, there is a recently launched NICER mission, Neutron Star Interior Composition Explorer. Uh, so this is trying to observe, uh, trying to measure neutron star radii up to 5% accuracy. You can also determine compactness, which is the ratio of the mass to radius from spectral lines that are obtained from uh, neutron stars. So there are all these different observables that you can determine from these multivalent observations. Okay, so these give you um, information about uh, the neutron star structure. So I just told you about the mass radius curve. So now if you look at the real data, you can see that in this picture on the right, you see all these different um, masses that have been ob obtained and most of them scatter around uh, a value of about 1.4 but you see the circle ones so these are the extremely high mass neutron stars so high mass neutron stars help us to uh, like uh, have a cutoff for the observations so all the theoretical models at least the maximum mass should be compatible with that of the obs observed neutron star masses right so what happens is this gives us a way to distinguish between different equations of state. So now if you see this, this jungle out here, so these are mass radius curves for many different models. So all of these theoretical models have been pitted to some saturation properties or some collision properties and so on. And they predict different masses and radii for neutron stars. But now on top of that, you can put in the observation lines, see these horizontal bands. So this red line at the top is that which corresponds to two solar masses. So now we claim that all these models which are above this line are, um, are valid, whereas those which fall below are ruled out. Okay, so this is not, uh, I mean, this is a more complicated picture than that, but at least, uh, I mean, in a simplified way, this is something we can, we can say that this is a way to filter out what, which models are realistic and which models are not. Now this, I mean, this is one example I gave you. Of course, there are other uh, like radii and moment of inertia. I told you that all these obs observables give us information about the neutron star structure, right? So now a completely new window to the, uh, this entire picture has opened up with the discovery of gravitational waves. So if I tell you a little bit about what these are, so I have to go back and tell you about, um, of course, about gravity itself. So the general theory of relativity, you already know that it was proposed by Einstein back in 1915. And of course, it was uh, the theory of gravity, which, um, which was a different picture than that of Einstein, and uh, that of Newton, sorry. And what this general theory of relativity now proposed is that um, space time, uh, I mean, gravity is nothing but uh, it is um, an entity. It is a property of the space time itself. And uh, say neutron stars or any objects which are extremely massive, they bend space time around them. And therefore they uh, create this gravitational field around them. So if you uh, watched the LIGO India uh, National Science Day online, I think you can still find the YouTube video. So there was a very nice um, demo exhibit on the space-time curvature. So um, here you, I mean, you can go back and look at it. So it was like a heavy ball, which was put on a curved surface, a curved sheet, and then rolling balls around it. You could imagine that this is what happens when you have a massive, massive object bending space-time and then creating a gravitational field around it. So now 
Another very interesting prediction of gravity or the general theory of relativity is that uh, if there are any kind of perturbations on this fabric of space-time, then gravitational waves will be generated. So this can happen in two ways. If there are binaries of compact stars, so it could be black holes or it could be neutron stars or it could also be black hole neutron star binary. What happens is that when they come close to each other, they deform the space time around them and give off gravitational waves. They fall closer and closer together and ultimately they, uh, there is a coalescence. Okay, and um, so this is what happens in the case of binaries. And also it is uh, known that isolated neutron stars or isolated black holes, they can also give off, if there are any perturbations or disturbances inside uh, these compact stars, they can also give off gravitational waves. This is something like these fluid perturbations that we already know from fluid experiments. So um, why are these interesting? So like I said, these are now a new way for us to probe into the nature of dense matter. So to give you an example, neutron stars, um, so any kind of non-axisymmetric deformation, so not ax axially symmetric, but non-axisymmetric deformation uh, can generate gravitational waves. So these can have different sources. So for example, you see uh, these glitches. So what are these glitches? So neutron stars, they emit um, electromagnetic radiation from their axis, right? And as this happens, they gradually slow down and their periods, the, their spin periods slow down in a very smooth way. So in general, if you have a, an omega like frequency versus time plot, you will see a very straight line. So it's just slowly slowing down very smoothly. But then there are these sudden jumps in this frequency and these are called glitches. I mean, the reason of glitches is not yet understood. Some people think it could be related to the crust cracking. It could also be because of some superfluid components inside the interior. But the point is that if there is a sudden glitch, it can generate this uh, non axisymmetric movement. And this can also produce gravitational waves. Similarly, if you have, uh, I mentioned magnetars. So magnetars are uh, strongly ultramagnetized neutron stars and also magnetars can be extremely deformed because of the strong magnetic fields. They also show flares and outbursts and these bursts can also produce gravitational waves. So any kind of uh, non axisymmetric perturbation in the star can also generate gravitational waves. The other very interesting thing is that uh, like I said, fluid perturbations are already known from fluid experiments. And it is also known that the sun, our sun also has a different kind of perturbation. So this is very similar to earthquakes. In earthquakes also, we have uh, different modes of oscillation of the earth. In the sun, uh, there are also these different fluid modes. Uh, they are called F mode, P mode, G mode, R mode, etc. Depending on the what kind of restoring force brings it back to equilibrium after being perturbed. So this field is called helioseismology in the case of the sun. And similarly, we have a neutron star astroseismology, and this is also the study of different kinds of mode of modes of oscillation in neutron stars, and they give us a lot of information about their interior properties. So what, are, what is the composition? What are the different viscous forces inside the star that damp out these kind of fluid perturbations? So all this is encoded inside the gravitational waves. So now the point is, if we can catch these gravitational waves, then it should have, so the frequency and the damping time scales of these gravitational waves contain all this information inside. So now the challenge is to detect them. So the first detection of gravitational waves was indirect, and this was obtained by Joseph Taylor and Russell Hulls back in 1974. So what they did was they observed a, a pulsar binary, which is named after them. It's called now the Hulls-Taylor pulsar. And what they observed was how these two binary pulsars were coming closer and closer together. So to do that, they had calculated exactly the, the change in the orbit according to general relativity. And then, then they measured the trajectory and they found it to be exactly identical. So this 
uh, led them to obtain the Nobel Prize in 1991 for this discovery of the, it's basically the first indirect gravitational wave detection. Now this of course motivated scientists all over the world and now they wanted to build really um, detectors, right? So that can detect these gravitational waves directly. So there were of course several attempts in the beginning, Weber tried some uh, experiments, but these were not successful. There were also experiments like GEO and TAMA. So what they did was they built these interferometers. So these L-shaped interferometers. So what happens is that uh, if you know a little bit about interferometers, the idea is that there are laser beams which are reflected along the two axes, then mirrors. You can see this in the uh, at the bottom, this um, uh, I can maybe tell it again. Uh, so what happens here is you see this laser source, it is reflected uh, into two arms and then these are uh, made to be reflected back onto the beam splitter and then a photo detector detects the fringes that are produced. And if a gravitational wave passes through it, it changes the arm length. No matter how small the change is, it can be detected very, very accurately by the change of this fringe pattern. So this is an interferometer. Now the problem is practically building it because you can understand there are many different noise sources. There is thermal noise, there is seismic noise. So this is why these arm lengths are kilometers long. So for some of them, these are meters and for the LIGO detectors, you can see here the picture of the Hanford and uh, Livingston uh, LIGO detectors. These are four kilometers long. And the Virgo detector, which is at the uh, French uh, Italian border, this is also about four kilometers long. And these have to be extremely, uh, like this is an engineering marvel actually. So because these have to be extremely isolated, the suspension, the laser, so all this is, a, is an engineering uh, challenge, a huge engineering challenge. So um, you see here in this picture, these are the different sources of gravitational waves. So not only compact stars, but there are also other uh, like stochastic gravitational wave sources and so on. But we are talking mostly about um, compact stars. So we are looking at this frequency range. And this is the strain, which means the change in the arm length um, for um, when gravitational waves pass through them. So you can see that this is around 10 to the minus 22 or 10 to the minus 24. This is the kind of sensitivity that we require to be able to detect this. So you can understand how difficult it is to have a system like this. So with the LIGO detectors, the initial LIGO detectors, this was not possible. However, uh, from 2010 onwards, there was the development of the advanced LIGO. So there was you know that technology is now uh, advancing in leaps and bounds almost exponentially. And of course, with this advance of technology, it was possible to build the advanced LIGO detectors. So bam, with the advanced LIGO detector came the first gravitational wave detection. So this was in 2016. And the object was, um, it was a, a compact black hole source, black hole uh, binary. It was, it's called GW150914. So this is because it was uh, on 14th of uh, September, 2015. And uh, these found this characteristic chirp signal. So what is this chirp signal? When the black holes merge, you see this, um, the um, waveform. So it goes from uh, like, uh, from a periodic one, ultimately, the frequency becomes faster and faster and the amplitude increases. It's almost like a bird chirping. So this is why it's called a chirp signal. So this chirp signal was exactly observed by LIGO, Hanford and Livingston both. And this was the first discovery of gravitational waves. So first direct detection. And this won the Nobel Prize to the, the three gentlemen who had proposed this in the first place to Kip Thorne, Barry Barish, and Rhino Weiss. So after this, so with the advanced LIGO, now came like a shower of discoveries. Most of these were gravitational waves from binary black holes. But then came a wonderful discovery in, uh, seven, on 17th of August, 2017. And this was a um, slightly different one. And uh, why? So you can see that these were way longer. So about uh, the others were uh, a few seconds long. 
sorry, they were microseconds long and this was seconds long. And this was, uh, the source was a gravity, uh, uh, sorry, a neutron star merger. So the first time a neutron star merger was directly observed in uh, gravitational waves. But not only that, the uh, speciality of the system was that this same system was observed in many other electromagnetic multi-frequency bands. So you see here in this animation, you see that this is what happened. So these neutron stars came closer and closer together, merged, and then produced these different um, multi-frequency um, radiation, which were picked up by the array of multi-wavelength um, uh, detectors that I told you about. Okay, so gamma rays, there was the Fermi and integral telescopes that were in, um, in action. So they picked up the signals. The Chandra um, telescope also picked up the X-rays. The radio frequencies were picked up by VLA and X shooter on VLT also picked up the um, optical signal. So you see that this was the first um, instance in history of multi-messenger astronomy. So this is not only gravitational waves, but electromagnetic gravitational waves and so on, and also multi-wavelength. So this was one unique system and it opened up an entire new field of astronomy. And what's more, there is uh, also another surprise. So this X shooter also found different um, spectra. So these absorption spectra that you can see here. And these two absorption lines that you see here, very clear absorption lines that were observed by X shooter. So what they tell us is the, they found uh, cesium and tellurium to be produced during this merger event. What does it mean? It means that if you see the periodic table, so cesium and tellurium are actually these heavy elements. And um, so there are different, uh, there were different models uh, suggesting the site of the astrophysical site of production of these elements or nucleosynthesis. So now with this discovery, this uh, the, it was now confirmed that neutron star mergers are indeed the site of our process nucleosynthesis. So this is the way of, um, this is the unique site of production of heavy elements. So like, like uh, so you can imagine now, so all these elements like silver, platinum, gold, which are precious for us, these were all produced in binary neutron star mergers. So how cool is that? So this is really an amazing discovery. So you see that only one, how, how um, you can see how amazing this gravitational wave uh, astronomy is. So with a couple of um, discoveries, we could say so much about the properties of neutron stars, that uh, what kind of elements are produced there, and also much, much more. Finally, <coughs> sorry, finally, um, another very important thing why we look at these compact uh, uh, binary coalescence is that um, when these neutron stars or when these compact stars are being, um, are merging, they distort each other tidally. So there is a tidal locking and why? Because these are very relativistic system. They have very strong gravity. So as they tidally deform each other, you can also see this, this is something predicted by simulations as well. These are um, general relativistic magnetohydrodynamic simulations. So what is uh, what it tells us is what kind of equation of state is there in the interior. So this is something that is now unfolding this puzzle of equations of state. So um, you see in this picture, so uh, the tidal deformation of the two um, participating neutron stars in the binary, so lambda one and lambda two, if these are actually functions of the different equations of state. These models are now depicted as different lines. And what this um, discovery told us was that um, uh, softer equations of state are uh, were more uh, favored by this observation. So this is just the beginning. So um, there are many different um, uh, more and more surprises being revealed by gravitational wave detections. Uh, you see here, this is an entire, uh, the family photograph of all the compact stars that were um, detected by the, uh, the LIGO-Virgo collaboration. So the yellow ones are the 
electromagnetic neutron stars. So these are the multi-wavelength uh, frequency observations that I told you about in the beginning. And you see the LIGO Virgo neutron stars are actually, they started populating this, uh, this picture. And also earlier, the electromagnetic black holes, of course, black holes are not observable themselves, but their interactions with uh, their surroundings can tell us something about their masses as well. So earlier, electromagnetic um, observations told us that black holes were somewhere uh, between 5 to 20 solar mass, okay? And like uh, neutron stars, I said electromagnetic uh, ones, the electromagnetic observations told us that they were around two solar masses. But now there is this entire new, um, like an, a window to the universe opening up. Now you see that there are so many LIGO Virgo black holes and not only 20 solar mass, but going up to 160 solar mass black holes. So there are many different models which are being questioned now. I mean, many of the things we didn't know about black holes and how heavy they can be and whether there can be extremely asymmetric uh, mass ratio in the binaries or they are more symmetric, whether there exists a mass gap between neutron stars and black holes or whether they are, they could be uh, very close to, um, they can have closer masses. So all these questions are being raised now and hopefully we will also be able to answer them with the help of gravitational waves. Finally, there is uh, so much more to uh, look forward to. So advanced LIGO, uh, like I said, so initial LIGO was uh, at a sensitivity of around 10 to the 21, 10 to the minus 22. Advanced LIGO did better than that. So it was around minus 10 to the minus 23. So you see here, these, uh, these lines show you the neutron star, neutron star merger and the black hole, black hole merger, and also the post merger phases. So this is the, the physics that we are looking for. And now there are talks of many more um, gravitational wave detectors coming up. There is the Einstein telescope. Uh, there is also the, the Kagura in Japan, which has started operations. And uh, the LIGO India is coming up in India. So LIGO India project is plans to move one of the LIGO detectors from the US to India. And also it's going to give a better uh, localization because uh, most of these are in the same as you can see, most of the detectors are in the same uh, latitude and long, I mean, uh, sorry, the same latitude, whereas LIGO India is going to give a better position and also better sensitivity. It's also going to involve better technologies. It's going to be the next generation, the uh, Gen 3, the third generation of like uh, gravitation wave detectors. Um, so there are many such uh, gravitational wave detectors proposed. There are also talks of NEMO being proposed in uh, Australia, which will look more into this post-merger phase. Uh, there is the Cosmic Explorer and so on. There is also There are also other missions like LISA, but LISA is more important for um, black holes and higher frequencies, not really for neutron stars. So, um, I think I will stop here. And uh, so, like I said, gravitational waves are uh, really one of, I hope I could convince you that gravitational waves are really the future and they are going to help us probe into the extremes of dense matter physics. Thank you. And please feel free to ask questions. We thank the Bharati again for the talk and uh, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much as well. Yeah. Okay. Bye.